welcome to our Launch and Learn series. Um, today we have um, Michael Lorenzini. Uh, he's a photographer, a professor, uh, he's an archivist, and he's currently the operation manager at the New York City Department of Records and Information Services. We also have with us Ken Cobb, our assistant commissioner at the New York City Department of Records and Information Services, and he has more than 42 years of experience with the New York City Municipal Archive. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Michael and Ken. Thank you, Raul. Um, I thought before we started describing the collections, the series of the collections in the Municipal Archives, we take a look at some of the photographs that Michael took on that day. I was on vacation that day, but Michael was, was here on his way into work. And why don't you show us what you saw as you came across the Brooklyn Bridge, Michael? Thank you, Ken. Um, so I actually had uh, flown into Newark Airport early in the morning of September 11th. Um, and uh, I was lying in bed at home and uh, I heard on the clock radio from WNYC that there was an explosion at the World Trade Center. And I grabbed my cameras and uh, was sort of heading out the door when the second plane hit. And I just started walking towards Manhattan and over the uh, Brooklyn Promenade. I lived, in, I lived in Brooklyn at the time. Uh, and nobody really knew what was going on that much. There was people, you know, it was people saying, oh, two planes. And, and we, I knew it was a terrorist attack, but I just, you know, the documentary photography instinct took over and I, I just, just kept walking into work and, and taking photographs. And as I walked over the bridge, you know, at first there was some people going over and some people coming back. And as I got further and further over the bridge, you just encountered more and more um, people from lower Manhattan um, trying, to, trying to get out of the city. Uh, and I was one of only a couple people heading in. And when I got to uh, just, I'd just gotten over the bridge and I was standing by Pace University and I'd run into some of my work colleagues when we saw the, uh, the first tower begin to fall. Um, and I just kept taking photographs um, as that tower came down and um, into, um, you know, the cloud of dust that sort of came and, and enveloped everybody and, and, and people running. And, you know, it's hard to describe how just terrifying those, it was to be there downtown when that happened. You know, everyone was in a panic. Nobody really knew what was going on. Um, cell phones were down. You couldn't really reach loved ones or anything. And I stayed in lower Manhattan for a little while, um, uh, just taking photographs of, of people who were, who were coming out of the, out of the rubble. Um, people often ask us, um, about the collections of uh, Mayor Giuliani from that day. And um, he did not have any of his photographers assigned to him that morning because he there was nothing on his schedule that they were they needed, uh, you know, events that they needed photographers. So we do have some photographs uh, in the Giuliani collections uh, from the following day. So these were actually taken on September 12th uh, when it was when his photographers got down there um, and documented him uh, visiting the site. But to be in lower Manhattan at that time, it was uh, the exclusion zone, I think, below, I think, the worst street. So we were not really allowed into our building. Uh, we had a week in which we were just told to stay home. But I kept wandering around lower Manhattan, um, taking photographs around the recovery work. And um, this is one of the night I documented uh, a flag that had been pulled out of the rubble, which I did think was uh, the flag that we have in our collection. So I recently learned it is, is a, diff a different flag that was pulled out of the rubble. But, but this flag here, um, we still have, and it's the same flag that is brought to the 9-11 an uh, anniversary ceremonies every year. And Ken can tell us a little bit more about the history of this flag. Um, but it's, 
it's been on it's been around yes it um it went up on the space shuttle at one point and every year the commissioner of the agency brings it to the 9 11 uh, memorial service however this is the last this past september 11th is the last year that the flag is going to make that journey we're now working with uh textile conservators to prepare the flag for permanent storage. And as Michael read from the test, you can still see remnants of the rubble. And I think you said that it, 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 the odor of the... Yeah, yeah, it still, it still smells. It still smells of the, the smell that lingered all over lower Manhattan uh, during those, those early months, that just this horrible uh, uh, burnt smell on the uh, if everything that, that burnt that day. So it's... Uh, it's time to retire. We're going to place it in the, the kind of stores that they tell us to do and we'll preserve it for, for, um, for future generations. So, so one of the things that I kept coming back to in that, in that uh, first, um, in that, in those first few days um, was Union Square, um, and uh, it was the largest of um, what were called spontaneous memorials. Um, and people would gather during the day and at night, uh, light candles, leave mementos, messages of peace, messages of war. Um, it became sort of a... Um, just a public place to, to, for people to air their feelings. Um, and it culminated in, in I, th I think this was the night of the 16th, uh, a huge, huge uh, vigil, um, thousands of people um, just filling the streets. Um, so I kept coming back here and, and, and photographing these. And I think on the right there is a, uh, Washington Square as well, which had a similar memorial. But the one at Union Square was sort of uh, kicked off by, uh, by this kid here in the middle. Uh, his name is Jordan Schuster, uh, who happened to be a friend of mine. He was a 19 year old NYU student and he had some uh, butcher block paper, just uh, uh, butcher paper that was a brown paper from an art project. And he felt like he wanted to do something um, and he just walked outside of his dorm and he rolled out some sheets of this on this on the square and he asked people to express themselves and they did um, and they would come during the day and at night and they'd fill these sheets of paper and I, I saw uh, in an Associated Press article they said they laid out hundred and fifty of these sheets um, over the course of nine days um, and I believe we actually have that one. Uh, and here's another one that we ended that ended up in our collection. Um, and I think some of these were, are with the 9-11 Memorial Museum and some of them also may have ended up at the Museum of the City of New York. But um, I was amazed to find that the ones that we have are in such good condition still. And then the, uh, the reason we have them, too, is that the uh, Parks Department collected them. Yes, the Parks Department contacted us and asked us to take in what they had collected from the parks. And as Michael did reminded me, luckily, they had kept track of the weather and they saw that uh, some rain was coming. So they quickly packed up what was at Union Square before it was... Uh, inundated with water and which is good because obviously that is not a good thing for this kind of for these kinds of mementos. Yeah and and the Parks Department also gave us material that was collected from Battery Park City uh, and a few other locations and I think in the, that case uh, one of the reasons that stuff was not in good condition is that it was collected uh, weeks later after it had been exposed to the elements um, and a lot of that was just, you know, when by the time we got it, it was too moldy to really save. The next big project we did was the uh, Pier 94 Memorial Wall, and maybe you want to talk right. about that. Well, the mayor's office has a unit called the Mayor's Community Assistance Unit, CAU. And they, I think, 
within a day, they had set up what they called a family help center, a family crisis center on Pier 94 in the Hudson River. And family members would come there for information. And as you can see, they began to, it was a spontaneous thing. They began to post the, the missing posters and the, the, the photographs because in the beginning there was, they thought, well, this person, these people will be found. So they post them there. And several months later, they closed the, uh, the Family Crisis Center and asked the municipal archives to come and document what was placed on the walls and to remove as best we could the items that had been placed on the walls. And I believe, Michael, were you part of the team that yeah. photographed? So we, so we came in and we, we realized most of these were posted onto uh, foam core where there was also writing. Uh, and foam core is not really a good preservation item. Uh, it's, it's just not going to last long term. So we decided that the best thing to do was to photograph these as they were in situ and then to collect all the materials um, off of them and, and preserve them separately. And we actually got a grant from uh, uh, Kodak, uh, gave us all the film, eight by 10 inch film. We shot these with a, a big uh, um, a field camera. Uh, and I can't remember how many, how many panels there are total, but it's something like maybe 60 panels total. And we photographed them in color and black and white, um, just black and white as a better preser long-term preservation media. Um, and Kodak paid for all the developing as well, which was back when Kodak was flush with money. And again, we collected all, all the materials from there. Now that I think was in this November, December that we did that. And, you know, downtown, we were still working very close to, um, you know, this ongoing recovery at the World Trade Center. And, and this is from March, of um, 2002, um, and we were allowed down into the pit uh, briefly to document the, the work that was going on there. Um, these are some uh, beams that are being removed from the World Trade Center. But we actually got to go down into the pit and, doc and photograph some of the workers and document some of the work that was going on there. <clears throat> um, then in July, of 2002, we were allowed to go out to Fresh Kills Landfill, which is where all the debris from the World Trade Center was being sifted through, um, you know, on a massive, massive scale of material that they were pulling out. And the workers who were sifting through it were um, all, uh, or mostly FBI agents, um, other, other uh, police officials, uh, and they would just sit at conveyor belts all day long and look through the rubble uh, for anything that was an artifact or, you know, human remains. Um, you, and we saw things like this, just giant twisted pieces of steel that they were putting in piles. And some of the artifacts, larger artifacts, they were, you know, putting aside and, and, and storing like these, uh, these pieces of a uh, fire truck. Um, but they also collected a lot of smaller artifacts. And these are two elevator floor numbers uh, that were uh, given to the municipal archives. Um, and we still have those in our collection. And also from there, uh, we, we received two pieces of aircraft aluminum from uh, two pieces of, of the planes that hit the Trade Center. You see they were signed by the FBI agent who recovered them. Um, and this here is a, uh, is a firefighter's oxygen tank that was recovered. And later on, we were given a piece of, uh, a piece of some of that steel that was recovered. Um, and this is a vertical support piece. And you can see those steel pegs are where the floors uh, were, were uh, bolted in. And you can see that one of the pegs there has sheared off, but they, um, you can see where the, they failed when the floor is pancaked. All right, well, 
Now it's one year later, September 11, 2002, and the mayor's office asked us, Municipal Archives, to go to the ceremony that was taking place that day. And they asked us to wait until the ceremony was, was finished. And by that time, it was actually dusk and was dark. And they wanted us to collect the, what the families had brought. We had no idea what we were going to see. Uh, I guess you must have taken this picture we were finally released in, into, the, uh, into the memorial site. They wanted the family members to leave. We, we did not interact with the families at this point. It was just the workers there. So this is what we saw. And Michael began to walk around there and take photographs. And as we gathered up what you're looking at there, and it turned out. Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the site was very sealed off. Um, there was a lot of press outside of the pit. Um, as far as I know, I was the only photographer allowed in the pit that day. Um, and, um, you know, I have to remember in 2002, this is not a time when anybody had a phone, uh, a camera on their phone. So, um, so it was a bit of a, an honor to be allowed to go in there and document this. But we, again, after the families had left. And I started to see that family members had left these little makeshift spontaneous memorials, not just in that reflecting pool, but around the site, um, leaving mementos and photographs. So I started to document those. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's just, I can still remember, it's just how it was very emotionally powerful moment to be alone there in the pit um, just at dark, wandering around and and seeing these. And some of the family members had branched off and written things on the on some of the remaining walls. You can see in the background the famous slurry wall that they built to keep the river out of the um, basement of the World Trade Center, basically. Because we couldn't take this concrete wall with us, I was trying to document as much as I could, um, uh, you know, the, the site on that day. But all this material we collected and all the flowers. Right, we didn't expect to see the flowers, but we later found out that uh, they had been donated uh, to the, every family received flowers. And of course, many of them, they left them at the site. So, um, and they said we needed to take everything. So we took the flowers as well. And it turned out um, we didn't really know what to do with the flowers. So this conservator, Laura McCann here, she called her mother and her mother said, well, you hang them upside down in a, in a dry place. So there's Laura hanging them upside down. And we did as instructed. And uh, we still, I think there's an image coming up, but um, we'll, get yeah. to that in a minute but here's some of the other materials that we we, we uh, rescued from the uh, memorial yeah there and you have to remember as you saw like because of those those water filled pools a lot of this stuff had gotten very wet we had to separate things out from frames we had to dry it as best we could um but you know, we had to deal with things as, as they came. We set up trestle tables in the halls downstairs, covered them with paper, and just quickly laid, put everything out as fast as we could. And most of it survived fairly, fairly well, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so here are the flowers 20 years later. Then I guess Laura's mother was right. Um, you, can, <laughs> you can preserve flowers if you really want to. Yeah, it's become a sort of ongoing preservation question because they do sort of slowly fall apart and they're very fragile. It's, it would be very difficult to actually display them. Um, they, you know, every time you touch them, they're just sort of turning to dust, but, uh, but they are, they have been preserved. So this became an annual tradition. Every year we would come in and um, after the families had left and we would, we would um, go down into the pit and we would, with volunteer staff, collect all the family mementos. 
we stopped collecting flowers in later years. Uh, the parks department would take them, but um, every year the plant, the, the layout changed a little. Some years they did two square reflecting pools on, on the footprints of the old towers. Uh, they did a round pool like this with two squares in it. Um, but one of the things that started happening after that first year is that people started to write on these wooden supports around the reflecting pools. And so as we were collecting all these artifacts, I was, I was photographing these, these wooden supports, uh, but then we were asked to take the supports as well. Um, so from 2002 uh, on to, I think, 2010, we took them almost every year. And again, you can see here how a lot of these framed photos or other photos were just put in the, the, the pool of water with all the flowers and um, always causing a preservation challenge. The flower for, became a tradition, but um, as Michael said, uh, the Parks Department um, took them and I believe they had a special sort of mulching program to uh, do something appropriate with them. But we, we, we continue to take the artifactual materials. Yeah, some family members would put things in Ziploc bags or otherwise protect them, uh, which was, you know, became a, a nice uh, thing for us. And I guess they realized after there's always going to be water, so yeah. they uh, smartly put things in bags. Yeah. And you can see, too, how uh, these, these, these beams themselves became quite filled with, with messages. And the other thing we kept noticing every year was that, you know, we got to, we got this opportunity to just sort of see how the site changed. Um, you know, it was really more and more becoming a construction site as they were rebuilding. So every year we'd notice the little changes or expansions. I think this is where they were putting the uh, path train back in uh, that uh, covered shed area is the, is the loop for the path train. And I believe there were some years when we were down there where actually the trains were actually pulling up. You could actually see the trains pulling up while we were down there. Yeah, they brought the path train back as quickly as they could. Yeah, I think that's from 2007. Um, <clears throat> this here was a, uh, they were uh, collecting the, uh, I, I believe they call it the Stairway of Hope. Uh, it's the stairs that led out of the, um, of the, the shopping plaza that were, was below the World Trade Center where a lot of people uh, managed to escape up that stairway as, as the buildings came down. Um, and they uh, moved that to the museum, right? I believe that's at the, I think that might be at the Memorial Museum now. But they actually had to build this framework around it to remove them. This was the last year that we went to the site. Um, this was uh, 2010, uh, or maybe this is 2000, and, it might be 2009, sorry. This, I think we went in 2010, but this was the last year that I was there. And uh, it was, as you can see, a very rainy day um, that year, adding to our challenges. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the, the writing on the boards got smeared because of the rain. Oh, and here's some, uh, here's some of the, the Parks Department staff collecting the flowers that year. We should go back to the uh, supports for just a minute. Um, just this past year. Well, we're going to have some more images of the oh, we supports. Okay. We're going to have some more images of supports, but I'm going to, but this is, uh, why don't we talk about, you talk oh, about yes. the clear grant. In 2012, we got some federal funding to describe and catalog um, the materials that we've been talking about. And as you can see, we place them in archival containers and um, it's now in the proper archival storage conditions and it should be available for researchers for many years to come. Um, yeah, this, I believe these are, this box here is material that was left at Union Square. So some of that material that I photographed uh, 20 years ago. 
um, different signs, people left behind, messages, teddy bears, lots and lots, lots of teddy bears. And lots of teddy bears. Another significant series consists of correspondence sent to the mayor, Mayor Giuliani primarily, which was all very carefully saved and cataloged, as you can see. Yeah. I like the little, someone wrote there, yay New York, underneath the stamp there, 34 cent stamp, Fort Worth, Texas, this person's writing from. Yeah, there was, there was, there were, not just mail, but there were items, um, gigantic uh, uh, condolence cards sent from all around the, the country and really around the world. Yeah, the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, some of these are quite extraordinary. Some of them were, you know, made of materials that just did not preserve well. We, we tried to make sure that uh, materials like this that were, um, uh, uh, this is on canvas. It's, you know, it's going to last a long time. I, I couldn't even get a full shot of this thing. I think it's about probably about 30 by 30 feet or something of canvas. And there's, it's one of several panels um, that were that were sent in um, that, you know, these have been also been preserved. Related, related to the correspondence, I think we maintain I said, Michael said that it's it's not just paper correspondence, but if people sent physical things, we call them gifts, to the mayor's office, and they were maintained. They've been maintained as a separate series. Yeah, and you know some of them are are <clears throat> I think you know quite quite meaningful. I I didn't include a photo of it, but there was uh, uh, an urn filled with. Uh, dirt and an urn filled with water from the River Ganges that were delivered um, uh, by an uh, Indian minister to uh, to us, and I believe the museum right. has some loaned the museum. Yes, we've loaned those urns to the 9/11 Memorial Museum. Yes. And more recently, um, we've taken those giant. Those, these are in our new uh, warehouse facility, the, those, uh, those giant wooden supports from the 9-11 um, memorials. And we, we hired a photographer to uh, document every inch of them. Um, and uh, we did a installation with, through Photoville this year, exhibiting um, um, some selection selection of those memorials. We're also planning to, um, I guess you would call it a crowdsourcing project where people can look at the photographs and transcribe the information that had been written on them so that researchers, even family members could um, kind of look at, the, look at the way these things changed over time. Uh, did they change over time? That might be a question you would ask. And I'm not sure if we've launched that yet, but that's something that we are planning to do shortly. Well, there's one other series that we don't have an image to show you, but the Department of Design and Construction um, was tasked with documenting the, what would you call it? The um, dissolution of the, of the site, the, the the taking away of what remained there and so on. And they documented it with photography, an enormous collection, uh, over, 100, over 100 cubic feet of photo, photographic materials. Um, it's immense and it's basically in the condition in which we received it. We've not really processed that material yet, but it's on our, on our very long to-do list. Yeah, and in, in addition to that too, there was also, um, the other collection uh, that we didn't really mention was there were people sent in unsolicited um, uh, design plans for memorial and for rebuilding the towers. Um, I don't remember how many, do you remember how many of those? Several hundred, I believe, of, 
design plans that we also uh, kept and cataloged. Thank you so much, um, Michael and Ken. Now I'm going to pass the mic to Latonia because we collected the questions from the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to say uh, it's Brooklyn Bridge Park, Pier 3, and it is still um, up. I believe it's up through December. Um, okay, our first question. Um, Marianne asks about where the flag was found or used, the one that you showed earlier in the program. Um, the, both of those flags, as far as I know, I mean, they were they were recovered from the, the rubble. Um, I was trying to determine it where, where exactly they had been. I think they may have been flags that were in the plaza beneath the towers. Um, uh, the one that we have, um, it I know it was went on a uh, it went on a ship to uh, the Gulf, then it came back, then it went up um, on the space shuttle, um, and then eventually was given to um, uh, and and that was and that was found by two police officers, uh, and then that was given to us um, through a gift through the mayor. Um, and like I said, it's brought out every year, but this year was the last year. And Anne asks, uh, will that flag be on display? I believe it is. No. It is it's not. No, no. We're planning to put it into storage. It, 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 it needs to be preserved for, for the future. We can't, uh, it's too fragile to be put on, on a permanent kind of display. We'll photograph it, of course, before we pack it away. Mm -hmm. Okay, Louise asks, what item hit you the hardest from the site? I don't know. That's a... <clears throat> I think those um, missing posters are the most difficult to look at. When we received the federal grant and we were hiring archivists who would then spend every day for the next year working with this material, we were very concerned that how would they be able to do that on a daily basis? And I'm not sure, uh, we, we did get, in fact, there were two archivists who did a fantastic job. And I asked her one day, how were you able to look at this material when you know what it represents? And she said, well, I tend to, I know that because it was so many years later that life went on and many of these families had family members who went on to have, you know, the relationships and children and children grew up and she said she concentrated on that, not so much what she was actually looking at. Yeah. I, I think for me, and I mean, there's, there's items that were, that were collected from the site from the initial disaster that were, um, you know, very moving. But I think the thing that really always got me every year was um, seeing the messages um, that people were leaving behind. Uh, not, not Some of the more powerful ones were not even on those risers, but people might leave behind a card or something. And it would be, you know, a mother just like tell, writing to her dead husband about, how the children are getting on and what's it's, you know, they were just really just heartbreaking to, to see that, you know, there was still that, that loss was still very powerful for them. Okay. Uh, Jan asked a different event, but did um, your Boston archivist colleagues seek guidance from you in the wake of the 2013 marathon bombing, uh, where they were tasked with disassembling and caretaking the grassroots material, uh, was at those sites. Yeah, well, Ken went to a conference, Well, right? um, Jan, as, as Jan knows, um, at the 9-11 um, Museum, and I believe it was October 2019, uh, uh, brought together a group of, of archivists and people associated with these kinds of memorials that now exist around the world. It's really kind of horrifying to think that there are enough people to have a conference. But anyway, we did and we shared 
shared our experiences in, in these kind of um, spontaneous collections. You know, one day you're just doing a job and next thing you know, you're collecting from some terrible event. And um, I can't say that we specifically spoke to the Boston people, but uh, I have to say, Jan, that was an excellent conference and it was really, really interesting uh, to talk to the people who had were kind of in the same position that we were rather unexpectedly. Okay, and Brooke asks, did you keep every stuffed animal or similar items left at the site? I volunteered with a small group of local archivists and librarians to collect the memorial materials from the Mother Emanuel church shooting in Charlestown, South Carolina. We made the decision not to keep the stuffed animals. Uh, they were donated to hand out to children. Um, we did not. Um, initially, we took a lot of stuff in just because we felt like it was such a, you know, it's, when you have an event that's that powerful and people say, oh, you have to take in this. It, I think we just took in everything. And, and, and then later on, when we did the, the clear grant, we, we processed that, um, you know, we saved a lot of the material. But, you know, we, because of the conditions, some of this material was left out in, you know, you discover, you know, these are moldy now or just it's just it wouldn't be. We, we talked about getting rid of uh, some of them to to uh, to, to children, but then we were concerned about the safety of them because because uh, some of them did have mold. So we tried to uh, uh, keep the ones that were in best best condition or a representative sample. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you so much, Ken. Uh, do you have any closing words for the audience? Uh, no, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I heard so there were some comments in the chat. The sound quality wasn't great. I apologize for that. But um, no, it's it's a uh, thank you for all being all for being here. Okay. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and see you on next month in our upcoming launch, launch and learn series. Bye.